Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number 10 in this Bible study unit on holiness. It's a study of the letter of 1 Peter, and so you'll need your Bible or your Bible app open to 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 4 today. Uh, there is also a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Scroll down, click on that link. It's a PDF. You can download it to your computer and then print it out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and then there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through uh, together afterwards. That's such an important part of Bible study, that discussion time afterwards with people who love you and whom you love and who you're doing life with. That's such a, an important part of our spiritual transformation. I hope that you're taking advantage of that as well. Before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray together, shall we? We're always excited, Lord. We always approach your word with a sense of anticipation, a sense of expectation that, that you have a word for us, uh, that, that not only will you help us understand uh, what you are saying, but why you are saying it to us, and maybe most importantly, that you'll help us to understand what that means for us in terms of next steps, because we want to be doers of your word, Lord, not just hearers. And so, as we open your word today, will you open our hearts and our minds? Will you change how we think about things in order to change what we do? Will you make us doers of your word? We love you. We love your word. We love its place in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Holiness in the midst of a broken world. Uh, the theme throughout all of this unit and the theme through this letter from 1 Peter has been this idea that, that we should be pursuing holiness, that, that when Scripture talks about holiness, it's talking not about being better than other people, not, not about being superior to other people, but, but being different, being set apart uh, in such a way that it draws people towards God, that it turns people's attention toward God. And so that's what holiness is about, and we've, we've, we've have seen lots of different aspects uh, and shades and phases of it uh, throughout, the, throughout the first nine lessons. Today we're going to see yet another one. Uh, Peter has been talking uh, in our lessons about how we relate to this broken world, and, and, and he specifically, a big chunk of First Peter was devoted to uh, how we as Christ followers relate to the institutions of this world, of this broken and fallen world, even when those institutions may be abusive uh, from time to time in how they play out. Uh, institutions like marriage, institutions like uh, government, uh, even institutions like slavery, um, and, and, and how we should relate to that and how we should connect with that as Christians. Uh, and, and really, it's been all about submission and what submission really means and what submission looks like. It's also been a lot about suffering. The theme of suffering is woven all throughout uh, First Peter's letter, and it's because he was writing to a group of new Christians uh, who were in fact suffering. Uh, they were being persecuted and he was writing to them and helping them understand how to do this, how to, how to relate to that. Uh, today is an interesting twist. Today we're going to be looking at some words from Peter about uh, what Scripture is referring to when it talks about end times. End times. Uh, it's kind of an eschatological view towards some of these same themes and what those end times would mean for us in terms of how we demonstrate submission and more importantly how we demonstrate holiness now uh, we're going to be we're going to be picking up right where we left off uh, last week we left off at the end of chapter three with uh, talking about suffering the way jesus suffered and, and we're going to continue peter's going to continue in that thought for the first couple of sentences into chapter 4 as well, that we should be following Jesus, and because he suffered, we, should, we will be suffering also. There will be suffering involved with being a Christ follower. And what does that look like? What did Jesus' suffering look like? The innocent suffering, the purposeful suffering, and it should look the same for us. And he continues in that theme, I mean in that thought, uh, in the first uh, two or three verses of chapter 4, before he gets into uh, kind of his next topic. So let's just pick those up and, and finish off that discussion, beginning with 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what it sounds like. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, uh, 
so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. <laughs> so what is Peter saying here? He's finishing up this idea of suffering. You're going to, if you're going to be a Christ follower, you're going to encounter suffering. When you suffer, you should suffer like Christ. And when that happens, when that happens, then you should in turn not make that suffering wasted, but you should in turn begin to live your life uh, in a way that pleases God rather than a way that pleases your own desires. Following Jesus does mean suffering like him, but it also means thinking like him, and it also means living like him. Thinking like Jesus means a complete surrender of every area of my life to God's will, to what God wants. Um, and so we, we no longer live for our own human passions. We no longer live day to day just to get what I want, just to get what feels good to me, what I want, what, what, would be, what I think would be best for me. But we begin to live more and more as the spiritual transformation process takes hold and begins to happen in our lives as Christ followers, we begin to live more and more for what God wants. Um, the time, he says, the time that is past suffices for living like the Gentiles. In other words, we have all spent quite enough time already living for our own desires. Whatever amount of time that is in your life, it's enough. It's quite enough living for our own desires. It's time now as Christ followers, if we say we're gonna follow Jesus, it's time to really follow him and begin looking for the things that he wants for us and not the things that we want for ourselves. If we're following Christ and if we're suffering like Christ, then we not only should begin to want the things that he wants, but the desires of our heart will begin to shift as well over time. Those things, those fleshly desires that we want, the things that I want but God doesn't want for me, I will want those less and less and less over time. Our suffering like Jesus actually leads us to more and more complete surrender, and that in turn leads us to having our very desires changed, having the things that we want change. And so, uh, whatever that area in your life is that you struggle with, whatever that area in my life is that I struggle with, for now I may be having to make intentional decisions to do what God wants rather than what I want, but over time what I want will actually begin to change and become more and more like what God wants for me, and that's Peter's point here in terms of suffering. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. For the Christ follower, total surrender means pursuing what he wants, that is God, rather than what we want. Indeed, when we are getting it right, what we want is being transformed to look more and more like what he wants. And so that question that God asks of us from time to time in our prayer time, Blake, what do you want, is, is not a question that is designed to say, because I want to give you anything you want, but rather it is a question that is designed to have us examine our hearts and ask, the things that I'm wanting, are they the same things that God wants for me? And if not, why not? And what is that, what, how much transformation is yet to be done in my heart as a result of that? This is why the gospel was preached, he says. This is the whole point that Peter is making here. This is why we have the gospel in the first place. Look what he says beginning in verse 4. With respect to this, in other words, a reference to what we've just said, with respect to this, they, that is the Gentiles, that is the people who are not following Jesus, the people who, who, who we are trying to get their attention focused on God, those people, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though, that, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. What exactly is he saying here? Again, Peter is focusing on the impact of our obedience on the people around us. When we lean into this holiness that God's called us to, when we begin to look different, make different decisions, um, uh, make different choices in our life than the way the people around us make, 
uh, then it begins to draw attention to us, but more importantly, it begins to draw, draw attention to the God um, who, who's receiving the glory for those decisions and those choices. Those who malign you will receive their judgment. Uh, he's, what he's saying there is those, uh, at the beginning, they, make, they may make fun of you. At, at some level, they may even persecute you because of these decisions. God will take care of that. You don't have to worry about that. That will be between them and God. That will be something that gets taken care of between them and God at some point. It may be further away in the future than you want it to be, but at some point, that, that will be dealt with. What you need to pay attention to is whether or not you're pointing people to God. The gospel was preached, it sa he says, even to those who are dead. Now, what exactly does that mean? What does he mean by the gospel was preached even to those who are dead? I think that uh, in my interpretation of this, what I think what he's saying here is all of us are dead in our sins when the gospel finds us. So it finds us in a place of complete death. Uh, until we surrender to Christ. It's, it's very similar to the way Paul uh, sometimes would talk, even Jesus, both of them would talk about uh, us being dead in our sins. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talking in verse 1 about this same concept. He says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we are subject to God's anger just like everyone else. What he's saying there is that's how the gospel finds all of us. It finds us dead in our sins. Uh, so the gospel finds us in that dead state and then it opens a new way for us to walk away from that death, to live in the spirit, what Peter says is to live in the spirit the way God does. Uh, how, how Jesus, having been given authority, this is how he said it, having been, how, the way Jesus described this, having been given authority over everything, right over everything, he describes it this way in John chapter 5. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, listen to what he says, but they have already passed from death into life. So when Peter talks about proclaiming the gospel even to the dead, I believe what he's referring to here is to all of us as we existed before we began this journey of following Jesus. Suffer like Jesus. Here's his point. Suffer like Jesus and think like Jesus in order to live more and more like Jesus. And this is why he would say that that outcome, that's the reason the gospel message was preached to us in the first place. This is the expected outcome of the gospel message. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement on your listening guide. I tell you the truth, and this is just a, a restatement of what I just read to you from John chapter 5, verse 24. It's just a, a quote from that. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, for they have already passed from death into life. John 5, 24. All right, so Peter's going to continue then uh, uh, with a compelling reason for holy living. Why? He's really, he's really delving deep now into the why holiness. Why should we live holy lives? He's given us a lot of the how uh, so far. He's given us a whole lot of how uh, very practically. But now he's going to come back to a, a really compelling why, why it's important in the first place. Um, and remind, just a reminder, the theme here, because it's not, it's not necessarily jumping off the page, and so I want to remind you, the undercurrent here, the overall arching theme of this entire letter is holiness. So listen to what he says beginning in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. All right, the end of all things is at hand. What in the world does that mean? Um, well, it means what you think it means. It means that Peter is referencing end times. He's referencing the end of the age, the end of this world. Uh, and he says it's at hand. Uh, 
So here we are now sitting 2,000 years later and it still hasn't come. So what are we to make of that? Was Peter just wrong? Was he mistaken about that? No, not at all. Uh, not once we begin to get a glimpse and an understanding of the way Scripture talks about the end of ages or the end of time. Uh, the, the Scripture always uh, thinks about Jesus coming as the end of times. Now, in ancient, the ancient Hebrew mind, there was only going to be one coming of the Messiah, right? But, what, but when Jesus came, we began to understand, no, there was actually two comings. There's Him coming in the flesh the way He did the first time, and then there's going to be a second coming of Christ. And so, as we take the whole of Scripture, we begin to understand there are actually two comings of Christ that signal the end of, the end of time. The way Scripture thinks about this, though, is, and particularly the ancient Hebrew Scripture is, it begins to look at these two mountain peaks, if you will, from a perspective that puts them both together. It begins to, it begins to look at them as a, as a singular event covering whatever time period it covers. It's a singular event. So the coming of the Messianic Kingdom uh, began with Jesus' first coming. It began with that. But it's almost as if the Messianic Kingdom has opened up, but we've only just walked into the entryway of that Kingdom, and we, we aren't really enjoying all of the fruits of that Kingdom yet. The age of the Church, the age of the Holy Spirit living through God's people, uh, is what ushers in that Messianic Kingdom. And so it has begun. But the, the, the Scripture tends to think of the end times as this singular event, but actually it covers a really long time in that regard. The coming Messiah, uh, the Old Testament prophecies concerning uh, the coming Messiah do tend to mesh these two events together and see them lined up together almost simultaneously. They, they, they don't pick up on the nuances of the timeline in between them so much. Uh, so, what they've done is they've zoomed out so far, the prophecies zoom out so far from these two huge events that they see them as a singular event at the end of time. Uh, so also, 2 Peter 3.8 uh, comes into play here uh, and, and helps us understand this. 2 Peter 3.8 is the verse that, uh, that says, uh, for God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. See, God doesn't exist on a timeline. and so. Uh, and so from a spiritual perspective, from a spiritual non-linear perspective, non-temporal perspective, these two events together represent the coming of the end of time. Uh, so the end has now begun. We are standing on the edge of eternity, uh, so to speak. Uh, my, uh, one of my favorite commentators, Bob Deffenbaugh, uh, uh, this is a quote from him, the way he says this, each and every generation lives on the edge of eternity, for their eternal fate is sealed in life and commences at the point of death. And so all of us, all of us stand on this precipice, on this edge of eternity, and we have this one little short lifetime to make whatever decisions we're going to make in terms of where we spend the rest of our eternity. So very much, it feels, when you put it that way, it does feel very much like we're standing right there at the edge, right there at the end. So, Peter says, in light of that, live accordingly. Live accordingly. And he gives us specific examples. Be self-controlled. Be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. What does that mean, sober-minded? I mean, I think it means don't be, don't be swept away in mob mentalities or in groupthink, but rather see truth for what it is independently of the way uh, the culture around you is swaying. You've got to be able to see truth independently in your prayer times. Loving one another earnestly earnestly, knowing, understanding what each other, what we need, and then moving to meet those needs. Loving one another earnestly is not giving one another what we want. Loving one another earnestly is, is giving one, one another what we need the most, looking and seeing those needs and moving to meet those needs, including physical needs. And then showing hospitality to one another, uh, opening our homes to one another, uh, what's mine is yours, uh, uh, that, that idea of hospitality. All of these, all of these illustrations, all of these examples that Peter gives us for how then should we be living in light of the fact that we're all standing at the edge of eternity, uh, 
Uh, all of these are, uh, are, are things that move us along towards holiness. These are examples of holiness. But more importantly, all of these present, frankly, a real challenge to us in our current culture. I think if you think about our current culture, you can see lots of ways that our current culture actually operates against these ways of living, actually operates against self-control. Uh, our current culture actually operates against being sober-minded because our current, current culture wants us to get swept up with all, in all of the groupthink, in all of the mob mentality. It operates against earnestly loving one another, and it operates against uh, showing hospitality to one another. Uh, so during these end-of-all-things time, right, during this culture, this 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 season, this time on, the, on God's timeline that represents the very edge of eternity, the very end of all things, during those times, Scripture is very clear, it's just going to get harder and harder and harder to live a holy life. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement. Simple things like being self-controlled, sober-minded, earnestly loving, and genuinely hospitable seem more and more difficult as our world gets more and more broken. Uh, and they will only get harder and harder as we move forward in time on our timeline. So Peter having said that, in these times, holiness is gonna be manifested. What he's saying is holy, holiness then is gonna be manifested largely in how we relate to one another. That's gonna be the clearest way of people being able to see the holiness in our lives in terms of how we relate to one another. So. Having said that, he's going to continue in that same vein, beginning in verse 10. Look what he says. As each has received a gift, he's talking here about spiritual gifts, spiritual giftedness, the work of the Holy Spirit manifesting himself through us as believers. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Again, what Peter is doing here is he's telling us that in these end times that we're living in, that our journey toward holiness is going to include how we steward the Holy Spirit manifesting Himself through us, these gifts, this giftedness that we, that we, that we have. And, and He gives us some important, um, some important observations about these gifts. Number one, He says every believer has one, as each has received a gift. So every believer has the Spirit of God manifesting Himself through him in a way that we recognize as a giftedness, a spiritual giftedness. Uh, number two, uh, this giftedness is to be used on one another. We're supposed, to, we're, 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 we're supposed to use the work of the Holy Spirit in us to minister to and to speak to one another in how we engage with each other. And number three, uh, all of these, all of this giftedness, this is all just a variation of God's grace. Uh, Paul himself refers to it as a manifestation of the Spirit. Peter refers to it as a variation of God's grace. Uh, in both instances, it's, it's a part of God. It's a piece of God working through us. Uh, look at Peter's focus. Note this, Peter's focus on the Spirit itself manifesting through us. In other words, what Peter's saying here is this is not just an ability that you've developed on your own. This is the Spirit of God Himself manifesting Himself through a believer. It is God Himself. Um, if, 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 so if, if my gift then, when He goes on to show examples, He, he divides the, the giftedness into two categories. Some gifts have to do with speaking, some gifts have to do with doing, serving. And, and He talks about both those categories. So with regard to speaking, when I speak out of my gift, it's not me speaking at all. It is the Spirit of God speaking through me, and I should be looking for that. I should be facilitating that to happen. I should be getting myself out of the way, and I should be allowing the Spirit of God to speak through me. Every time, uh, every time I sit down to teach, before I teach, my, my prayer is, God, don't let this be my lesson. Don't let it be my thoughts. Don't let it be me. Let it be you. Um, and, and, and so it, when we speak out of, the, out of giftedness, then it is to be God, the Spirit of God speaking through us. Same way with serving. Uh, 
when we serve, it shouldn't just be out of our, some motive that we've conjured up on ourselves because I feel guilty and I feel like I ought to be doing something good for this person. If that's the case, that's not the Spirit at all. It should be the Spirit of God moving through me and resonating with that person to begin to meet those needs. It should be the, 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 the power and the strength of God equipping me to do that. And so in both cases, in both cases, what we're really doing is getting out of the way and allowing the Spirit to work through us. And so if that sounds like more of Peter's talk on submission, it should because that's exactly what he's talking here. He's going back to this concept of submission to the work of the Spirit in us, submitting to the, theory, to the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to move through us. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last statement on your listening guide. In this age of the church, our submission to the Spirit of God manifesting itself in us and through us, we call this spiritual gifts, is a large piece of what holiness looks like for God's people. And then I quote there, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. All right, so when we think about this being, standing at the edge of eternity, being the end times, however many thousands of years that may last, when we think about it that way, and we th then what are our takeaways about holiness even in the midst of end times? Here they are. Number one, surrender means having what we want transformed and changed into what God wants so that we actually begin over time wanting the things God wants. Number two, following Christ means we have already passed from death into life. It's already happened. Uh, the gospel message found us when we were dead in our sins. Number three, being self-controlled, sober-minded, earnestly loving, genuinely hospitable, uh, these are the things that we should be, the kinds of things that we should be pursuing in our pursuing holiness. And those things in the end times are just going to get harder and harder and harder because the culture is going to be flowing the opposite direction. It's going to be, we're going to be swimming upstream in that regard. And then lastly, in this age, holiness includes the proper stewarding of our spiritual giftedness, of the way the Spirit of God is manifesting itself through me how I steward that, how I get myself out of the way, how I submit to that and allow that to take place in other people's lives is a big part of leaning towards or journeying towards holiness in these times. These are my takeaways. I wonder what your takeaways are from these verses in chapter four. Uh, I hope that you guys have an amazing week in the week ahead. Uh, in the meantime, I love you guys and I will see you right here next week. Wherever we, wherever we left off here, we'll pick up in the same place next week. I'll see you then.